Hat Check, a Troy Bodine Tropical Thriller, Volume 1. Written by David Behrens. Narrated by Theo Holland. Part 1. Hat Check. Put one person's hat on another person's head. Chinese Proverb. Prologue. Non-discretionary spending. Rick Hare had not known before today that the barrel of a gun tasted like pennies. Or maybe the taste was the coppery tang of his own blood pooling in the crevices of his ever-swelling mouth. He also had not known that the butt of a gun felt so heavy and cold when used as a hammer on one's head. He guessed he would probably lose most of the teeth he'd spent so much on veneering prior to the last election cycle. He wondered if he'd ever get a chance to see his dentist again an odd longing to see the dentist. As the current vice chairman of the 2012 Merrill's Inlet's board of directors, he counted his acquisition of funding in excess of $7 million for the tourism conservation and wetland education project as his crowning achievement. It was a private deal with several under-the-table understandings. All parties to the deal would remain anonymous, and a small fee of half a million deposited directly into another account of his choosing for managing the deal with discretion. But beyond selfish interests, the money would provide the local community with informational pamphlets, catchy bumper stickers, kids' coloring books, and rental home refrigerator magnets discussing and educating tourists about the delicate ecosystem at work in his precious inlet home. Counting the zeros on the check helped him stomach the fact that the money had come from the nearby consolidated paper mill. Naturally, the check had come with an understanding. Rick would bury any mention of the pollution the independent environmental scientist had discovered traveling downstream from the mill. The mill's owner had channeled the money through a governmental-sounding company and encouraged Rick to say he'd procured a federal grant for the work. With this cover story, He'd soon be rising above vice chairman. As the blood trickled from his nose, he vaguely wondered if the two hooded men interrogating him suspected that a completely untraceable cashier's check with a seven and six zeros was tucked away in his outback tea-stained straw cowboy hat. Another thought occurred to him through his throbbing haze of pain. What if these two men had been sent by the mill owner to collect the check and get rid of any evidence of the deal? namely Rick. But that didn't make any sense. The deal had just been made and everyone was happy to go along with the stipulations of said deal. Okay, happy was a stretch. But when Rick had chosen the life of a politician, he'd been too green to know the lower-tier guys in local governments made little, if any, in the way of salaries. Some were even volunteer posts. Most were only in it for the power. He smiled wanly at that last thought. What power did the vice chairman of the 2012 Merle's Inlet's board of directors actually have? Not much. But his acquisition of these funds, however ill-gotten, would have gone a long way to further his ambitions. And he'd long since given up being selfish in that regard. He was in it for his daughter. He thanked God he'd had the foresight to wire his half a million straight into her account. He smiled at the thought of her checking her balance the next time. He ached with the thought that he probably wouldn't be around to explain the huge addition of funds to her. The outback, tea-stained, straw cowboy hat he wore had been a gift from her long ago. She'd only been six or seven at the time and thought the hat was just perfect for her dad. And though it was somewhat out of character for a short, pudgy, bald man to wear such a thing, he wore it proudly. As he struggled to maintain consciousness, he couldn't remember why he had folded the check and slipped it into the band of his hat behind the colorful peacock feather perch there, but there it remained. Rick retraced his steps back to the meeting at the mill and sorted through what he could remember of the conversation, but nothing struck him as sinister. He'd walked out after shaking hands with the mill's owner, and there had been smiles all around. His last text to his daughter a newly acquired skill for him, had said he'd be stopping by for dinner. For the life of him, 
He couldn't figure out what had prompted this sudden kidnapping outside Lee's inlet kitchen and was even more unsure of why they had smashed the butt of what had appeared to be an AK-47 against his face, sending his beloved hat skidding across the floor. He would have handed over the check had they just asked. He tried to tell them that, but now his efforts to speak were hampered by his crushed jaw. His dinner of Lee's homemade clam chowder exploded violently from his stomach with the pain from the first wicked blow to his skull, and he was still retching as they hovered around him whispering to each other. "'Where is it, mate?' one of the hooded men growled in a strange broken accent. "'Maybe Australian. Or South African?' Rick opened his mouth to answer, but all that came out was more of his favorite from the appetizer menu at Lee's. This apparently was an unacceptable answer as the man's fist slammed into the top of Rick's head, dislodging his expensive European hairpiece. Guaranteed to stay on in a hurricane my ass, he thought to himself as the toupee flopped to the ground. His bald pate glistened brightly as blood began to flow warmly down into his eyes. His thoughts began to jumble wildly through his life, and he saw himself in his high school senior pictures with already thinning hair. After a few unsuccessful attempts at a comb-over, he just clipped it closer and closer to his head. By the summer of his senior year, he was a 19-year-old bald guy. It had been bad enough that he was born with a build like that of Danny DeVito and not as good-looking as most of the guys he'd played with on the football team, but his last name was Hare. Hare, for God's sake. With a name like that, and a chance to reinvent himself upon starting college, he'd sought out remedies to his ever-expanding baldness. Since the summer between high school and his freshman year at Clemson University, he'd been a closet member of the Hare Club for men. Before the chocolate-brown strand-by-strand woven head of hair had become part of him, his high school classmates often asked if he had shaved it because of sickness or cancer treatments. Sometimes he said yes. Years later, his wife, Susan, of 14 anniversaries, had succumbed to the pancreatic version of his line. When he visited her in the hospital, he would remove his hairpiece and be bald with her as she suffered. He wondered if his current hair-jarring episode was karma circling back around for another go at him. As the images faded from his mind, he wasn't sure if he was losing consciousness, the blood was clouding his eyes, or his thick-rimmed glasses had finally shattered away. But his vision began to swim and darken. His head lolled down to touch his chest, and he thought with sadness that he would never get the blossoming red stains out of his seersucker sport coat. God, he loved that jacket, just like Matlock. As if on cue, South African number one ripped the front of the jacket open and shoved his hands down into the inside pockets. No, Rick moaned, but no one was paying any attention to him, just like no one paid attention to him at the city council board meetings. But all that would change when he delivered the seven million dollar check. His view of the world was dimming rapidly when the man tore into his pants pockets, scattering the assorted contents on the concrete floor of wherever they had taken him. A small, crumpled toddler picture of his now-grown stepdaughter floated out of the hooded man's grasp and hit the floor. A spatter of blood from Rick's forehead dripped down on the picture. Everything was in slow motion now. He knew his end was near. He wanted to cry out, Take my wallet! Take my 56 Dodge Royal Convertible! Take anything you want! Take the check, for God's sake! Just let me live to tell my sweet girl I still love her! but his wrecked jaw could only mumble and spew blood. The check! In his final thoughts, he wondered how they had missed it. His eyes flitted to the forgotten cowboy hat lazily tilting to and fro under a nearby metal table. And that's when darkness ended Rick Hare's tenure as the 2012 vice chairman of the Merle's Inlet's Board of Directors. Chapter 1. Troy's Crick Troy Clint Bodine stood motionless on the rickety wooden dock. The sun had risen slowly above him, and the heat of the day was just beginning to warm his skin. He had his brand-new, ridiculously expensive, Loki lightning redfish rod propped against his left thigh, 
and his right hand gently tested the silvery web of line for any sign of resistance. He dabbed a trickle of sweat from his eyes with the light blue bandana around his neck and pushed his salt-stained LSU cap back on his head. Two hours of daylight had brought him absolutely nothing. Not a tremble, not a bite, not even a nibble. Damn you, Debbie, he thought, rolling a toothpick back and forth between his teeth. The tropical storm that grew only slightly above the hurricane designation, dubbed Debbie by the World Meteorological Organization, had plowed through northern Florida and churned up the east coast, leaving Pawley's Island with nothing to catch but a sunburn. But no one else was out, so he thought the few fish that may have been left in the storm's wake might be hungry and food might be scarce. It was looking more and more like he was the only one out today, including the fish. Hurricane Debbie, he thought. What a perfect name for the storm, just like his ex-girlfriend, Debbie Robinson, in Vegas, who had crashed into and out of his life and left nothing but baggage and debris in her wake. Good riddance, he thought, as he chewed a little harder on the toothpick between his teeth. Troy had seen a great many things in his life. He'd had a relatively incident-free tour as an Apache AH-64 pilot in Afghanistan that ended abruptly with a shrapnel-ruined right ACL. Upon rehabilitation and return to the States, he'd found his only surviving relative, his youngest brother Ryan, had been honorably discharged, reason unknown, and disappeared. Troy had been shot at from kingdom to come, took a hit to the knee that almost cost him his leg, and survived hell on earth, only to find that he had no one to come home to, no friends, no family, no nothing. Down and out and alone, he grabbed one of the few vocational opportunities offered to an injured war vet, bartending in a shady Las Vegas strip joint, the Peppermint Hippo. More than a few of his war buddies were patrons of such establishments, drinking and laughing loudly over the sound of gunfire in their heads. His own tour had been short enough that he never heard those phantom screams. After a few desperate months of searching for work, he'd taken the job of DJ slash bouncer. Lucky for him, the job included the apartment above the club that was little more than a one-room loft with a bug-ridden bed, a futon, a dorm room refrigerator, and a hot plate. After the thumping stripper tunes finally went quiet around five in the morning, he'd slept on the futon and eaten lukewarm spaghettios out of the can. More than once, a strung-out stripper or two had crashed in his bed. Without him. A hero's welcome indeed. But Debbie had been different, or so he thought. She wasn't called Cinnamon or Candy or Portia on stage but rather Gidget, a name he fondly attached to the movie starring Sandra D. Her music had always been rather tame as well, leaning more toward Bon Jovi than Marilyn Manson. He'd never seen her touch alcohol or any of the other mind candy handed out in the alley back behind the club. She always made the customer happy without crossing whatever professional line there could be between a stripper and her mark. When she'd asked to stay with him, it had been because her Mercedes had refused to start after her shift, and she wasn't going to let Slick Mix quick towing screw it up like she'd seen done to so many abandoned cars in the club's gravel lot. Even if it was only a Class C, it deserved better than that. He'd offered her a beer, and they'd finished what was left of a longboard 12-pack by 7.30. They hadn't even slept when the Mercedes dealer's flatbed truck came to rescue her ride. In the glow of their buzz, she grabbed his cell phone and typed in her number. You'd look great with a beard. She'd brushed her hand on his then only stubbly cheek and climbed into the tow truck, sporting a pair of his gym shorts and an old LSU hoodie. He hadn't known when he finally worked up the nerve to call her that she'd stepped out on the balcony of her extravagant condo atop the MGM to take his call and set up their first date. He also hadn't known her husband had been in the living room of said condo watching the races and checking his numbers. A couple of dates later, a sudden unexpected and oddly quiet, awkward meeting outside her condo's bathroom door with her mafioso-looking husband had led to an embarrassing towel-only run through the casino floor of the MGM. Teddy, the mafioso husband, 
had come to the Peppermint Hippo escorted by Vinnie and Louis, apparently those names did really exist for Italian bodyguards, and politely asked him to leave Las Vegas if he knew what was good for him, which was exactly what Troy had been planning to do anyway. His bag was already packed. He took the 93 down to Kingman and hopped on I-40 and traveled east as far as he could hitchhike. When he got to Memphis two weeks later, he turned south on 55 and headed back home to Louisiana. He had learned to drink to pass the time during that long, crazy trip and spent the next ten alcohol-dazed years on and off shrimping boats off the coast of Louisiana. He made a lot of money and drank most of it up bought a boat of his own and became a bona fide businessman with a bona fide drinking problem. An alcohol-induced near-death experience in an overturned boat shook him out of that daze and he sold his boat. It made him enough money to set him up nicely for a while and keep him from hitchhiking to his new destination, wherever that would turn out to be. He took the first Greyhound bus out of town leaving the New Orleans Union passenger terminal in his rear view. Hours later, when he stepped off the bus into the hot sun, he was in Litchfield Beach, South Carolina. He spent the last of his money on an old, dilapidated beach house on Pawleys Island and had just enough left over to get a very nice fishing rod and reel. Watching the lazy creek water swim past his wooden dock, he thought he had just about seen it all. As he watched the abandoned 12-foot aluminum john boat drift in, he knew he'd been wrong. The boat itself was quite unremarkable. Hurricane Debbie was probably responsible for the unpiloted craft's lonely drift down the creek. It was old and salty, but only looked to be four or five years old. It was bluish-gray aluminum with only a trolling motor attached on the back. Behind the black identification numbers SC-1971-LD, it had large, sun-peeled green letters on the side saying, Rent me. It bumped against the dock he was fishing from, and he put his right foot out to push it back out into the current. Given his past with bad juju floating into his life, he was going to let this one float into someone else's path. That's when his eye landed on the hat. A beautiful, straw cowboy hat. Its owner nowhere to be seen. He looked slowly up the creek and then down the creek. When he was certain he was alone, he reached down into the boat and picked up the hat. It was worn, but in good shape. No holes, pretty clean and expensive looking. It had a brightly colored plume of some kind stuck into the band on the back. Peacock, maybe, he thought to himself. He sniffed the inside of the hat. Was that Old Spice? It looked well taken care of and smelled clean, so he thought he'd be assured there were no bugs in it. He gently laid the Loki rod down on the dock, removed his ragged LSU cap, and folded it into his back pocket. The cowboy hat fit perfectly. It rested neatly above his Costa del Mar Pescador sunglasses. With his eyes so well shaded, he saw the immense shadow of what had to be a thirty-pound red drum swim out from under the dock. That's a dang big fish, he thought, as he saw it jerk his line and send his ridiculously expensive rod and reel flying into the creek. Suddenly, Realization hit him and he leapt into action. Hey! he shouted and jumped into the water after it. The silver barrel of the reel glinted and he lunged after it, but the fish had other plans and took off. Unfortunately, the line was not reeling itself out, but holding fast and dragging his beautiful Loki away from him. He cursed himself for leaving the tension so high. He half swam, half crawled forward in the shallow water, thinking he must look like he was drowning or attempting a butterfly stroke, a very awkward butterfly stroke. He plunged his head under and squinted in the distance. The glint of chrome winked and rushed away from him into the dark water. He planted his feet on the bottom and lunged. His bad knee caught what could only be described as a blade of rock jutting out of the creek bottom and pain knifed into his leg. He ignored what he felt sure must be another tear to his ACL and plunged forward. He stuck his head up, and with a gasp of air and quick scan downstream, he again leapt toward the rapidly escaping rod and felt the end of it tickle his fingertips. But then it was gone. 
He lurched again, blindly flailing after it, and his bad knee jerked him back in a shock of pain. He limped up to a standing position, now harder to hold with one good leg, and peered into the current. There was no sign of the fish, the rod, or the reel. Dang it! He slapped the surface of the water. He lifted his leg to examine the damage to his knee. No cuts, just a few minor abrasions. It was starting to purple, but didn't look like he'd done anything more than bruise his knee, and his pride. He sat back down in the cool water. It felt good on his aching joints. As he massaged his throbbing tendons and watched the hypnotic current drift slowly down the creek, he wondered how he was going to eat tonight. He'd spent the last of his shrimping money on the Loki lightning redfish rod and a twelve-pack of Coronas. It was a greenhorn mistake, laying down his fishing pole unsecured. Harley, his shrimp boat first mate, would have given him hell if he'd... His thought was interrupted as the newly escaped John boat thumped him hard in the back of the head. He tumbled forward and swallowed what must have been at least a quart of salt water. Scrambling out of the path of the boat sent a new shock wave into his knee, and he coughed harshly, expelling the briny water. He gingerly stood up, and the boat nudged him like a lost dog. Double dang it, he cursed as he shoved the boat past him down the creek. Stop following me. It drifted away, finally seeming to look back plaintively. Troy flipped his hand toward it like he would have if it had been a stray dog. Go on now, get! Troy waded slowly, painfully, to the creek bank and began to limp his way back upstream. Taking stock, he was sure his ACL was retorn and an egg-sized knot had risen on the back of his head, but all in all, he was okay. He reached up to check the knot and was flabbergasted to realize the straw cowboy hat was still perched on top of his head. And there it would remain. His fingertips came away from the bump on his head with a small splotch of blood. Dang boat had split his skin, probably not bad enough for stitches. Salt water was supposed to be good for that stuff anyway, he thought. As he took stock, he was relieved to find his leatherman tool still strapped to his belt, his costas still on their croaky strap, but the LSU cap was long gone from his back pocket. Dang, he thought, lost my favorite hat. Chapter 2. Spotted Dick Deputy Chesney R. Biggins was the first on the scene after the tip had been phoned into the Garden City Police Department. His CB radio had squelched out the call, and he'd been only too happy to leave the Keep Georgetown Beautiful rally and head out to Midway Inlet. Dick, we got a hard one for you out there. The crackling voice erupted in snickering from his CB. Chesney, whose middle name was Richard, was the constant butt of jokes at the Georgetown PD. His very mature colleagues had discovered that his middle name, shortened to Dick, and his last name, Biggins, used together were far more entertaining than any of their old fart jokes. Chesney had heard it all before, in middle school. I'm on it, Todd, he replied with no hint of emotion in his voice. Thank you, Deputy Dick Biggins. Todd's boisterous reply was backed by howls of laughter. Chesney reached over and turned the volume down on his radio. Idiots, he thought to himself. He already had a full front and back page of scribbled notes with key details from the tip called into the station that morning. Holding the yellow pad in his lap, he reviewed the facts as he drove. One, two hikers, maybe joggers, had phoned in the tip at 7.02 a.m. Two, both are medical professionals on vacation from Tennessee. Three, discovered dead body of a man while jogging out by Old Beach Road. Four, Body was bloated and had apparently washed up on the beach. Their medical opinion, given the state of rigor, was that the man had been dead less than 24 hours. 5. Being vacationers, they didn't recognize the discovered man. 6. Man was dressed in a light-colored suit. Suit had some stains around the chest and neck. Blood? As Chesney read the last word, his cruiser slammed into something and jolted him out of his thoughts. What in God's name, he said as coffee sloshed sideways out of his thermos, burning his right hand. Great. 
It only took a second for him to register what had happened. With his eyes down, his cruiser had swerved onto the sidewalk and run into a parked ice cream truck. Several startled children were staring in wide-eyed wonder at the police car now parked in the crumpled mess of the truck. You gotta be kidding me, Chesney muttered, throwing his car into park and wiping the coffee from his hands as well as he could with the yellow pad. He sighed as he opened his door and stepped out of the cruiser. Immediately, he recognized the old-timey round ice cream truck that belonged to old-timey Willie. One-eyed Willie, as the local adolescent crowd called him behind his back, making a dirty joke that they probably weren't old enough to really understand, was a bent-up old black man from down in the deep south of Alabama. Chickasaw, he thought the old guy had told him once. Said he'd been the on-call cook for events at the J.C. Davis Auditorium and the Charles E. McConnell Civic Center. Said he'd learned to make ice cream down there that no one, not no one, could resist. He reminded Chesney of Dick Halloran, the chef of the Overlook Hotel, as played by Scatman Crothers in the Stephen King movie The Shining. He had that odd way of being the grandfatherly comfortable type and creepy as hell at the same time. He only had one eye, for God's sake. Willie's truck was a completely round vehicle with a pointed roof that was designed to look like some sort of circus tent. Bright blue and red diamond shapes attracted children from blocks away, while hidden speakers warbled out such favorites as Pop Goes the Weasel and Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. The impact to the police car was minimal. A basketball-sized dent in the bumper was the extent of the damage. The ice cream truck, however, was not so lucky. The back end was caved in, making the formerly round truck look more like a horseshoe or a crescent moon. Willie had apparently scrambled up on the coolers in the front of the truck to avoid the crash. He was still sitting there, shaking in half rage and half fear a Nutty Buddy ice cream cone in one hand and an orange crush-flavored push-up in the other. Both were halfway melted lumps of streaming, dripping goop sliding down on Willie's formerly spotless white ice cream man coveralls. My truck, he yelled, coming to his senses. Look what you gone and done to my truck. It wasn't easy to look Willie in the eye, his only good eye anyway. The other was covered with an oddly painted patch that was supposed to look like a clown's eye. The pupil didn't quite point in the right direction, giving him not only a crazy-looking eye, but a lazy one as well. Calm down, Willie. Chesney held his hands up. Don't worry. The city will pay for the damages. Pay for the damages? The one-eyed ice cream man slid down off the coolers and slopped the two melted treats to the floor. Do you know what kind of truck this is? No, sir, I don't. It's a fully restored Murray Mobile ice cream truck. He said Mary Mobile as one word. Murray Mobile. Willie lurched toward Chesney, and the officer swore he could see the eye painted on the patch reddening with anger. Creepy, he thought to himself, and shuddered back a step. Look, Willie. He raised both hands and eased toward his own car door. Just go down to the station and file a report. This city will make sure you're compensated for any repairs. Repairs? The ice cream man croaked. Who you know that repairs 1950s ice cream trucks, huh? Chesney said nothing but inched closer to his cruiser. Willie took his ice cream man cap, the kind that looked like an old white sailor's cap with a glossy black patent leather bill, off his head and smacked it to the ground. And here it is Saturday. Biggest day of the week for an ice cream truck. Dag nabbit! Chesney did not bother to reply. He quickly opened his car door, slid in, and shifted it into reverse. The metal squealed as his bumper pulled torn pieces of the ice cream truck away as he backed up. Willie screamed again as frightened children, who would surely have therapy requiring nightmares about this day, scattered in all directions. Clumps of ice cream spattered against Chesney's back window as he pulled away. Cruiser number 47 was back on track, heading south on Ocean Highway, though now it was dragging a sparking piece of red, white, and blue metal under its front end. Ocean Beach Road ended in a sandy gravel mix, and Chesney's tires crunched as he stopped his car. 
A man and woman were standing beside the road. The unlucky body discoverers, he thought to himself. The man looked to be in his late fifties with sandy brown thinning hair and was marathon runner rail thin. He wore almost distastefully small blue running shorts and a faded brown Life is Good t-shirt with a picture of a jogger on the front. Chesney noted that the man's socks were pulled up high on his calves and wondered if the man knew that had gone out with the seventies. The woman appeared to be around the same age, but more appropriately dressed in a blue road race t-shirt that was emblazoned with the bright orange words, Knoxville Track Club Expo. Chesney couldn't help but notice that while the man's hair looked windblown and unkempt, as if he'd been on a long beach run, the woman's blonde hair appeared to look the same way it might have when she stepped out of the door to go jogging. She was wringing her hands in worry and looked to be on the verge of tears. As he approached them, the man put out his hand and opened his mouth to speak, but the woman spoke before he could say anything. You must be the officer we were told to wait for, she said quickly and rubbed her arms as if she were cold. We've been waiting for over an hour and it's really starting to get windy. Well, at least it feels like it's windier than it was when we got here. Don't you think so, Jack? Jack opened his mouth, but she interrupted. She spoke, or rather tittered, rapidly and turned back to Chesney. But it could just be my imagination, what with all this excitement over the, well, over the... The body, ma'am? Chesney helped her. Once again, the man, Jack, opened his mouth, but she started again. It really took us by surprise, she thumbed toward the man, and he didn't even see it. I'm the one who spotted it out here, which is really odd, considering I didn't have my glasses and my eyes. Uh, they really are getting worse. I don't know what I'll do about it. Just keep buying strong reading glasses, I suppose. I'm sure the nice officer doesn't want to hear about your reading glasses, Diane, Jack said with a grunt. Jack and Diane? Chesney pointed his pen back and forth from the man to the woman. Oh, yes, Jack and Diane Smith, the woman said, from Knoxville, Tennessee. We've been coming to Polish for over twenty years now. She considered this for a moment and launched into it again. Gosh, almost thirty years, I guess. We used to stay at the Dolphin House on the north end of the island, but then we moved further south to a new house. It was okay, but I didn't like the layout of that one. This year, we're staying in a beautiful place. Chesney scribbled a new note on his yellow pad as she continued to ramble on. 7. Joggers are Jack and Diane Smith It was all but inevitable that the song lyrics entered his mind. Something, something, something about Jack and Diane... Something, 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 doing best they can. When Chesney looked up, he realized she was still talking about their various rental homes on Polly's Island. Jack rolled his eyes and put his hand on her arm. I don't think this is what the officer wants to know. Well, of course it isn't, but I was just being polite. It's okay, really. Chesney looked around them. I'd actually like to have you show me the body. Jack opened his mouth again, but she started speaking before he could get a word out. Oh, yes, oh, yes. She spoke as if about a new baby in the family or an exciting new restaurant she'd discovered and laughed uncomfortably. It's really incredible to find such a thing. I mean, we are medical professionals. Well, he's in the NICU, and I'm, well, we have seen bodies, but it's not a normal thing for us to... And naturally, that's why you drove all the way out here. Yes, ma'am, it is. Chesney snuck a glance at Diane's husband, who said nothing but rolled his eyes. He had the feeling that he'd have to wade through the woman's never-ending details for at least an hour, when he might have gotten the same information, signs aside, from the man in two or three minutes. She pointed to the other side of the road and walked toward the cruiser. As she passed by, she noticed the scrap of metal hung underneath the front bumper and raised her eyebrows. Did you have an accident on the way? Something like that, ma'am. Chesney tried to brush off the story casually. A bit of a tangle with an ice cream truck. As soon as he'd said the words, he wished he could take them back. Oh, gosh, that reminds me of the ice cream truck we used to have in Louisville when I was a little girl. She was off again. It was round and had a tin on top, and the man would stand in the middle. I used to sit out by the end of the driveway with a nickel. Can you believe it was only a nickel back then? And wait on the ice cream man for hours. She laughed and kept telling her story, but Chesney's attention had shifted to the two bare feet sticking out of the scruffy brush. 
he couldn't help hearing more lyrics in his head. Something, 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 life goes on long after the something, something, something of living is gone. Chapter 3. Another Hat Trick Kara Campobello, whose mother couldn't decide between the names Kelly and Sarah for her firstborn daughter and simply combined them, had just finished reading page one of her new beach novel, Ocean Blue Murder, by Carrie R. Hughes, when she heard the commotion a few docks north of her. Her head was a little fuzzy from a drunken Jack's hangover, but she was suddenly alert with the prospect of something exciting happening today. She was alone in a hammock, and guessed the man she spotted hadn't noticed her lying there. It was something she was used to, not being noticed, but her sophomore year of college was going to change all of that. She was sure of it. Her dad had just bought her a glittering silver Land Rover that perfectly matched her Ray-Ban Wayfarers. Surely the guys at Auburn would notice her cruising the campus in her sexy new ride, if she went back. She had come to Polly's claiming to be in for the week on spring break, visiting her cousin, Laura Kate. But back in Auburn, her grades had been slipping and her performance on the volleyball team had been less than stellar. The partying life of a sorority debutante was taking its toll on her, and as a result, both her academic and athletic scholarships were in danger of going away. With school having been paid for, or so he thought, her dad had taken the money out of her college fund and bought the new Land Rover. A wonderful and terrible surprise. Kara was now in what she'd call a pickle. Without that money, her dad wouldn't be able to send her back. But God, that Land Rover was a nice ride. Oh, well, I'll figure that out before next semester, she thought. She laid the open paperback book on her stomach and watched the man a few docks away. He was a good-looking guy, maybe forty, a little lanky, in decent shape. His ruddy tan was the kind she'd seen on fishermen and construction workers. Jet black hair, almost shoulder length, crept out from underneath what looked like an LSU baseball cap. His hair matched his jet black, exquisitely manicured beard. He had sunglasses on, but she thought he surely must have blue eyes piercing navy blue eyes like the last scream of the ocean before a storm, her beach novel might call them. She grabbed her phone to snap a pic for Instagram. Hashtag spring break, hashtag vacay, hashtag best ever. Carol watched intently as the scene with the boat played out. Man picks up cowboy hat out of boat, exchanges it for his own cap. Ooh, bugs, she thinks, but continues to watch. Man pushes boat away from dock, but then leaps into water for no apparent reason, she hadn't seen his rod and reel fall in, and proceeds to splash and gargle his way downstream doing a butterfly stroke. The noise, and the man, continued to move closer, splashing crazily down the creek. Goosebumps formed on her sun-warm skin as she watched. This was way more exhilarating than her novel. She bit her lip as the man finally stopped swimming, and stood up. He rubbed his knee and peered down into the water, looking for something she guessed. His gaze was disappointed and never moved in her direction, though now they were only ten or fifteen feet apart from each other. He eased back down in the water, and she straightened to snap a photo with her phone. At exactly that moment, a streak of silver flew toward him from behind. She gasped, but soon realized the boat had caught up with him. Thankfully, it hadn't appeared to hit him hard enough to do much real damage. Even sprawled out in the creek, she could see he was more handsome at this distance than she had realized. This vacay is going to be amazing, she thought. She added the hashtags to her Instagram photo. Hashtag hottie, hashtag headboat, hashtag ouch. She almost giggled out loud when he sent the loose boat downstream, waving it off like a, well, kind of like a stray dog. He was muttering to himself as he limped out of the water and hiked back toward his own dock. The cowboy hat did suit him much better, she thought to herself. Sitting up, she watched as the boat he'd been wrestling with drifted past. She considered swimming out after it and hauling it back up to the man. I found your boat, she would say, batting her eyelashes furiously. But no, she had just washed her hair and didn't want to get it wet. Besides, 
He hadn't seemed too concerned about the drifting boat anyway. Putting her book aside, the first page now splotched and smeared with the sweat and suntan oil from her stomach, she rose from the hammock and stretched. She thought about pulling on her gorgeous new Trina Turk cover-up pants over her bikini. It was early yet, but the summer heat was starting to creep up in the rusty red Coca-Cola thermometer hanging on one of the gazebo posts nearby, so she left the pants folded on the hammock. She looked back upstream and watched as the mysterious and crazy hot stranger limped into a beach house a few homes up from her rental. She sat down on the edge of her dock and dipped her feet into the cool water. She pulled her hair out of its ponytail and ran her fingers through it. She would eventually have to knock on his door, of course, but she needed some excuse, a ruse to explain why she'd come calling. Come on, Kara. She kicked her legs slowly in the water and spoke to her reflection. What's it going to be? Can I borrow a cup of sugar? No, that was too obvious. She needed a hook something he would remember. So, I see you're a fisherman. Can you teach me to fish? Ugh, that was awful. As she pondered this, something brushed against her leg. She jerked her feet out of the water, expecting to see a fish or a snake, maybe even a jellyfish. But no, it was a small, lump-shaped thing, dark and purple in color. She leaned over to study it, and when she was sure it wasn't alive, she reached down and picked it out of the water with two fingers. The object quickly shed the water and she flipped it over. A smile crept onto her face. Sorry to bother you, she said, recognizing the LSU logo, but I found your hat. She grabbed her book and her pants and rushed inside, grinning with excitement. She felt like she was in a beach novel. Shower. Gonna need a shower. Chapter 4. Hair Today, Gone Tomorrow Deputy Chesney Biggins recognized the semi-bloated face of Rick Hare immediately. The vice chairman, ex-vice chairman to be exact, was puffed up and slightly blue. His hairpiece was missing, but that wasn't a surprise. Everyone that had known Rick when he was younger knew he'd been wearing a hideous chocolate brown toupee for the last fifteen years or so. What did take Chesney a few minutes to deal with was the fact that the man's eyelids and lips were half gone, eaten by various marine creatures. It gave him the odd look of surprise. Hey, Sarah, I'm going to need a wagon out here, he spoken to his walkie-talkie. We're going to need to call Winchester in on this one, too. Winchester? came the crackled reply at the other end. What's up? Winchester Boonesboro was the local district attorney and would surely want to be in on this, since Rick was an elected official, however trivial his office might be. It's Rick Hare, Chesney said. Oh, Sarah seemed at a loss for words. I'll make the call. Thanks. Rick was wearing a light blue seersucker suit that made him look like Mayor Larry Vaughn from the movie Jaws. Very Martha's Vineyard, Chesney thought. Around the collar of the suit were dark black maroon stains that were probably blood. Even in his bloated, chewed-up state, he had the marks from what looked like a severe beating on his head, face, and neck. He was no crime scene tech, but he knew Rick had been tortured, and torture requires motivation, usually motivation to get information. Oh, my God, came a shocked voice from behind him. That poor, poor man. Chesney jumped and suddenly felt like a gullible audience member who had screamed in a horror movie when a black cat jumped onto the screen. He had visions of zombie Rick Hare sitting up and strangling him. The sudden outburst had come from Diane Smith, the woman who had discovered Rick's body with her husband. Chesney stood and quickly regained his composure. Ma'am, sir, I have everything I need from both of you. He ushered them away from the body. If you will, I'm going to need you to go down to the station and fill out a statement. Just a formality, of course. He handed a business card to Jack Smith and watched as the couple walked back to the beach. Within a few minutes, the ambulance pulled up. By then, Chesney had done a full circuit around the body, careful to give it a wide berth, but looking for anything unusual that might give him a clue as to the nature of the councilman's demise. So far, he'd found nothing. 
Paul D'Antaglia, the township's paramedic, who also served as the medical examiner, nodded as he stepped out of the ambulance. Yo, Chesney, got something big, eh? Chesney pointed toward Rick's prone figure. Paul snapped on his gloves and carefully knelt beside the body as his assistant and wife, Carol, stepped out of the ambulance carrying a medical kit. Paul was a native of Maine who'd married Carol, a Bostonian, during med school and after successful careers up north, they'd semi-retired to Pauley's Island. Both were in their late fifties and had seen hundreds of crime scenes. Chesney had worked with Paul on several cases and thought the man made a great investigator, obviously being more medically savvy than a cop, but also more legally savvy than most paramedics, and more street savvy than the actual coroner. His insight was invaluable. Alas, poor Rick. Guess we can forego checking for a pulse. Paul said to Carol, Thermometer. She handed him what Chesney thought looked like a meat thermometer with a dial on the top and a long skewer on the end. Without much ceremony, Paul plunged it into Rick's side. After a minute or so, he looked up at Chesney. Given his state of rigor and liver temp, I'd say we're looking at about forty-eight hours. Chesney scribbled a few notes on his yellow pad. Ideas on cause of death? Well, he's got some obvious signs of animal gnawing, but I don't see any tracks to or from his body. With the bloating, I'm inclined to think he was nibbled on in the water. I'm sure they'll be able to see more when he's on the table, but it's obvious he was beat up pretty badly. Paul pointed toward Rick's head. This one here looks like it could be our culprit. At the top of the man's wispy-haired head was a deep gash. The wound was semicircular and looked to be severe enough to crush the skull, though there was no blood. Probably washed off in the water, Chesney thought. Looks like a pistol whip, Chesney mumbled. Somebody beat the crap out of him, maybe beat him to death. Oh, Jesus, Chess, who the hell would treat old Ricky like that? Carol asked in a Kennedy-esque Bostonian twang. I have no idea. Chesney paused, seeing a van of crime scene techs pull up and start unloading cameras and number cards and Q-tips. Hey, make sure they get everything. Clothes, shoes, pocket contents, all that. Might be something there to help us find out who did this. We'll get you everything you need to get this bastard. Paul slapped Chesney on the shoulder. For the next hour, more than 200 HD photographs were taken of Rick's body and the surrounding area. As the techs were snapping their last photos and cleaning up their number cards, Winchester Boonesboro pulled up in his black 89 Lincoln Town car. He didn't get out of his car, but waved Chesney over impatiently. Oh, shit, he thought. Not now. Deputy Biggins, what have you got here? Winchester demanded from his partially rolled down window. Have you got this thing under control? He sighed heavily. He knew the D.A. wouldn't get out of the car effectively staying as far away from the scene as he could and still be at the scene. Winchester Boonesboro, the son of a billionaire lawyer from Dallas, Texas, had a reputation for taking all the credit for successful cases and denying responsibility for unsuccessful ones. He was well known for pointing fingers at the shoddy work of those at the crime scene for failures. In short, nobody liked him. Chesney started toward the town car and opened his mouth, but was interrupted before he could speak. Hey, Chess, Paul called to him, saving him from a run-in with the D.A. Found something you might want to see. Chesney held up a finger, indicating wait just a second to Winchester, and headed back to where Paul and Carol were finally loading Rick's body for delivery to the coroner. Paul reached into the ambulance and held up two Ziploc evidence bags. When we picked him up, we found his wallet under him. Contents seem intact, but spilling out a bit. And this thing. He held up a bag with what appeared to be a small black USB drive. Chesney took the bags. Thanks, Paul. You betcha. The paramedic shook hands with him. Let you know when we've got more for you. He closed the back of the ambulance and they drove away, leaving the crime scene in eerie silence. Chesney was baffled by the USB drive. 
he'd have someone in the lab get all the data from that and log that into evidence later. He held up the bag with the wallet in it. Protruding out of the wallet's cash pocket, he could see a piece of paper, waterlogged and almost transparent. The ink was faint but still legible. He held it up in the sunlight and could read most of what was printed on it. Lee's Inlet Kitchen, Clam Chowder Appetizer, Bowl, $5.95. Iced Tea, $2.50. Peach Cobbler a la Mode, $6.95. Subtotal, $15.40. Tax, $0.93. Cents. Amount, $16.33. Gratuity, $25. Total, $41.33. Rick had scrawled in what appeared to be a $25 tip and scribbled his name at the bottom. Seems a bit excessive, Chesney thought to himself. Under the signature, it had the restaurant's address, phone number, date, time, and server's name, Georgiana S. Ah, I see. Chesney knew Georgiana Starlington. Anyone who had been to Lee's knew Georgiana. It seemed that everyone in town was infatuated with the restaurant's young waitress. In a town where the female waitstaff tended to be transient at best, she'd been there for quite a while now. Not one of the typical blonde bimbo types either. More girl next door, and that was indeed rare around here. Georgiana did have mildly curly, dirty blonde hair, but usually she had it pulled back in a messy braid or ponytail. Not too flashy, not too plain. She was probably five or six years out of college and had come to Pauly's with some kind of typical university degree that had led to, yep, you guessed it, bartending. She was definitely a cute girl. Chesney felt his eyebrows rise. Would definitely have to question her about. His thought was interrupted by the sound of an 89 Lincoln town car door opening. Please tell me I haven't wasted two hours of my life sitting in my car out here watching the Pauly's Island CSI poke around. The DA's voice was contentious at best, snotty at worst. I'm leaving today for a week in the Hamptons, and I don't want to be late. You have anything at all for me, deputy? Winchester spread his ill-fitting suit jacket apart and put his hands on his expansive waistline. Chesney opened the door to his cruiser and, without skipping a beat, reached into his shirt pocket and flipped open his sunglasses. In his best David Caruso, he said, Hair today. Pausing for effect, he put his sunglasses on. Gone tomorrow. Chapter 5 Guts for Garters Darren, the body, McGlashan, slumped down into a crusty, duct taped recliner in the back of a dark, mostly empty storage unit in a dark, mostly empty parking lot behind a cheesy tourist trap called Balls, as in beach balls. He was a scrawny guy. Thus, the nickname must have been one of those obvious opposite nicknames, like calling the biggest guy tiny or calling a really slow guy flash. The recliner squalled and creaked under even his emaciated weight and noticeably sagged to one side. Another truly giant, heavily tattooed man stood by the steel door peering out into the night. He chewed nervously on a McDonald's drink straw. His arms were sleeves of skulls and flames and tribal markings. No smiley faces or peace signs anywhere to be seen. In his back pocket, he had stuffed two knit toboggans with eye and mouth holes roughly cut into them. Under his belt buckle, he'd stuffed a small thirty-eight caliber pistol. The pearl handle had dark, gelatinous blood in the grooves. Well, that didn't go well at all, now did it, mate? Darren asked the nervous man by the door. Nah. Boss ain't gonna like it none. Nah. Darren rubbed his thumbs into his temples. Will you shut up and let me think, mate? The other man said nothing. Darren stood up and kicked his boot against the side of the recliner. It cracked and groaned, and one leg apparently rocked its last. The heavy chair lurched forward and fell on his right foot. Ah, shit! he cried. Will you bloody well keep it down? The tattoo man shushed him. Christ, the damn thing's broken my toe. Darren tugged at his ankle. Get it off me, mate. 
The tattooed man shrugged and mumbled. Stupid as a two-bulb watch. He reached down and lifted the front of the recliner, and Darren shrieked. Shit, 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 stop! What the hell? Put it down! The tattooed man dropped the recliner, and Darren screamed again. If you don't shut your trap, mate, I'm gonna shut it for you. Damn, it's cutting me, it's cutting me, Darren whimpered. Oh, for shit's sake. The tattooed man grabbed the front end of the recliner and heaved it backward against the storage unit wall. The metal clang almost drowned out the sound of the body's scream. In what appeared to him as slow motion, Darren saw the chair fly up and off his foot, followed by ripped pieces of shoe and his grossly severed first three toes. Blood spurted from the stubs and he screamed again before fainting. When he came to, he was back in the recliner and the tattooed man was back at the door. He was relieved to see that the man had apparently removed what was left of his shoe and tied a makeshift tourniquet around the ball of his foot with his own sock and remnants of the duct tape from the recliner. Toes, Darren croaked. Gotta get me to the hospital, mate. They can stitch him up good. The tattooed man nodded into the night. Tossed him. Shit. Darren could see the blood oozing through the sock and thought he might need to put some neosporin or antiseptic or something on the wounds. He reached down and gently massaged the upper part of his foot above what was left of his toes. It ached like hell, and he could feel his pulse throbbing in and out of the arch of his foot. They were smashed and useless anyhow. Struth, Darren mumbled. But shit, mate. Should at least let me toss them. Boss ain't gonna care about them toes. He's going to cut the rest off anyhow, if we don't get that check back. The tattooed man looked back at Darren. You dumped him? Nod. Can't be found? Nod. Good. Then we got to retrace our steps and find that damn check, or the boss will have our guts for goddess. Nod.